difficult to start. Um, okay, so today um, we are going to continue talking about state tomography um, uh, in the first part. And uh, what we're going to look at is an online algorithm for state to tomography. So the, the idea is... that um, you do a sequence of measurements, and after each measurement, uh, after each measurement, we update our estimate of the state. using, uh, in fact, only the new information, uh, information gained through the measurement. OK, so we start with some state. Let's call this row 0. Uh, and we'll fix that to be actually the uniform state. So that's kind of the state. That's how we start. We don't know anything about the state. So we assume it's. It's uniform. Um, and then we do a measurement. I call this measurement sigma 1. We'll see what, what that is. Um, so in, in our examples, it will be just be a poly measurement. Um, and we get an outcome y1 hat. Um, and then we do an, an update of the state, and we get row one, and so on. So we do another measurement, and so on, until hopefully we will converge to uh, row hat close to the true state row. So this is, this is the true state as before, and the hat quantities are our estimates. Um, and yeah, so, so what we will assume is in, in the following, that d is 2 to the n, so this is n qubits, and um, so this is the, the size. That makes it easy because we can kind of easily come up with measurements on, the, on that space. So we, we assume that these sigma i's are, in fact, chains of poly um, observables. So it's, it's, it's measurement observables of the form like this. And all kinds of combinations. So you could have, for example, identity tensor x tensor y. OK, so, so all kinds of, of such measurements. Um, do you know how many there are? How many poly measurements we can, we can have? Yes. Um, so it's 4 to the power of n um, minus 1, actually, because there is the all identity, which we, we are not doing. So it's 4 to the power minus n, which I can also write as d squared minus 1. Or Okay, so that's our, our uh, procedure. Now, we have to figure out how we do the update, right? Um, and um, we first have to think about what, what kind of the, the goal of, of, of this process is. So, so we want to update in each step our estimate of the state, but we obviously don't want to lose all the information we already have about the state. 
So we somehow need to control for that. Um, so we don't want to, to update um, too much. And the way this is done, so there is a trade-off between um, between updating and maintaining sorry maintaining the current knowledge And we do this by uh, considering two parameters. So the first one is we want to keep, or two, two goals. We want to keep the relative entropy between time step t plus 1 and the estimated time step t. We want to keep that small. So this means we are, we are kind of aiming to, to not update too much the state. Okay, so this is one uh, goal we have. Now, why do we measure this in relative entropy? Um, we could use different metrics here. It just turns out that the, the relative entropy gives us the right kind of uh, uh, behavior later on. Um, and the second thing we want to do is we want to improve our estimate using the, the, the measurement um, we just observed. So for that, we, we define a loss function. And this loss function is evaluated at our current estimate. And it is just the difference between um, what... Uh, between the expectation value that we would expect for the measurement under our current estimate and the expectation value we would expect um, from the true state doing this measurement sigma. Okay, so if our estimate is good, then this should be small. Yeah, like if, if rho is close to rho, then, then this is small. Um, and these are quantities that we essentially observe. So we're going to do a simplification in the following, by which we're saying that this quantity is actually observed. So we call this sigma t hat. So this is an assumption. Uh, that just simplifies our life here. It, it's actually not necessary in the end, but um, it assumes that there is no noise, right? Because usually, when you try to measure this expectation value, you do some kind of, of measurement with, with a finite number of shots. So you will get uh, this, this, this y hat we'll always have the expectation value equal to this, but it might have some variance as well. Um, but for simplification, we just assume that you do enough measurements so that you essentially get exactly the expectation. So this assumption is really that we have infinitely high precision. Or infinitely many measurements. Or maybe I should call this shots, not measurements. So we do the same measurement, but infinitely many times, so that we exactly get the expectation. OK. Um,
So once we have the loss function, we want to minimize it. So the idea is to move the states in such a way that we make this loss function smaller. Um, but at the same time, we want not to move too much. So we want to make sure that um, we stay close to the, the state we already have because in the past, we, we already gained some information, for example, about other bases, not just this sigma t. So we can't just forget all that and, and, and try to optimize for this measurement. Okay, that's why we, we, we need to um, look at this trade-off. Um, so what we do in the end and is we, we find Um, the updated estimate such that um, this function is minimized. So that will be the sum of the two terms. And here, this eta is where is a learning rate of the learning rate. Okay, by minimizing um, this function with with this one parameter that we can choose, we we kind of um, do this trade-off between the things. So we, so we want both of them to be uh, small. Now. This minimization, um, in the abstract, you can you can try to compute what what state that is by just um, the usual rules that you differentiate. Okay, it's a it's a matrix variable, so it's a little bit more complicated. But you essentially differentiate, and then see where the the derivative is zero to find the hopefully the minimizer, right? As as you would usually do. Now, um, if one does this. Um, um, and does one needs to do a, a, a bit of approximation, um, but essentially this yields so up to some approximations. Um, the following rules so rho hat t plus 1 is equal to um, c is some renormalization constant to make sure the trace is 1. And the actual expression is this one. Where, as I said, t is a a constant for normalization to make sure that everything is trace one, and this here uh, is the gradient of the loss function. Which one can just uh, uh, compute? So if if you look at the the loss function, you, you can take the gradient um, of that and um, it's just this this expression uh, times sigma t. So um, what really happens here? Um, so this gives us uh, an update of the state. Now, there, there's some observations in, in order. The first one is, um, do you know or do you know how what, what these things mean? I mean, you know what an x and a log is, but do you know what a 
act when the log of an operator is? I guess you do, yeah, because otherwise you couldn't compute the entropy. Um, so you, you would know how to, to compute this. You do eigenvalue decomposition uh, of these terms, and then you can exponentiate, for example. Um, so, so that's one um, thing. And then what this does actually is that it ensures that this is always positive, definite, semi-definite. Um, in fact, it's, it's positive, definite even, but that's a, a different um, issue. Um, we just want it to be positive, sem positive semi-definite, right? Because our states are positive semi-definite. So this update ensures this. Because it's an exp exponential of something, it's always going to be positive semi-definite. Um, what it is not is normalized, so that we, that we need to do by hand. And so we just take the trace of this and, and normalize it. Um, OK, so so it's always positive semi-definite by construction. But we need to get normalized. Um, good. Um, but also, is, is you can see, this uses obviously our our estimates that we have, rho t hat, and the new data, which is this this pair, essentially the measurement and measurement outcome. So those two things are used in the in the update, but we are not using kind of all the previous information. Right? One way to do this would just be at the, that at time t plus one, I just look at all the data I've already gathered and then do state tomography in the usual way. That would also give us an estimate. Uh, but here we actually only use the data from the last point to update. Um, this is useful for, for several reasons. Um, one might be that actually the data set that you collect over time is, is really huge. And so these um, tomography algorithms, if you would try to apply them all the time, would, would take a lot of, of effort. Um, whereas this, this update is relatively um, simple to do. You just need to diagonalize your, your matrix once and, and, and look at, at one data point. So one of them is efficiency in terms of the implementation. Um, the other is, is that um, this is online in, um, and it can actually follow the state. So if your state changes over time, um, then this algorithm could kind of follow it. And, uh, and you would still get an, an estimate of the state at, at the given time. Unless it obviously, if it changed too quickly then, then it, it will have to catch up. But um, in principle, it can follow a state as it changes over time, which is actually often happens in experiments. You, if you really try to, uh, you always try to consistently prepare the same state, but, but then maybe the temperature of some element changes a tiny bit, and the state will actually change with that. Um, and so, so you need to be prepared to kind of uh, update your um, your estimate of what the state is. OK, so the protocol really um, is now fully defined. So we start with a uniform state and then do these measurements. Each time we have a pair of measurement and, and measurement outcome. Um, and we can use that to, to update our estimate. OK, so now I need to convince you uh, that this actually works. Um, so that's, I mean, the protocol is defined, but I haven't convinced you yet that, that this will actually converge to the, to the true state. So uh, we're going to do that next. And um, yeah, so today, in, last time I was able to, to really give you fully uh, complete proofs of everything. Uh, today I won't be able to do that, but I give you kind of a, a sketch of of the argument. And uh, some of the steps 
uh, that I will need you actually prepared in the uh, in the exercise if you did them. Otherwise, you can look them up there. So I'll, I'll tell you where which steps are actually done in the exercise. So with the exercise, together with what I'm telling you now, you have essentially uh, the the full proof. Okay, so this is sketch of convergence proof. Uh, it should be on. Is it better now? I mean, it's green, so I don't know. Um, okay, so we want to show um, that as we um, go with time to infinity, and I'm not arguing, I'm not going to say anything about optimality in terms of the number of samples we need here. In fact, this algorithm um, wouldn't be optimal in, in, in terms of, of number of samples needed. Um, this is kind of an, an, uh, an open research question to, to analyze this um, algorithm well enough so that we, we can show that it's optimal. Well, probably would need to be adapted a little bit too. But um, in terms of sample optimality, I already cheated anyways because I said that we have this perfect estimate of the of the um, observable, of the expectation of the observable, which um, already requires an infinite number of samples if you really wanted that. Right, so, so, so we're not thinking about sample optimality. I just want to show that it converges. And that I do by the following statement. So I want that as t goes to infinity, the probability of the trace distance between my estimate and rho being uh, smaller than delta should go to 1 uh, for all positive delta. So this means I can approximate the state to arbitrary precision for, um, for large enough values of t. I will I'll be um, be able to do this for for any delta. Okay, so, so it really converges to to the state, but it's a probabilistic statement, um, and it has to be because the whole algorithm is probabilistic. So I randomly choose a measurement. Um, I haven't talked about that yet, but th this these measurements are chosen randomly from from this set, and um, so that's one way that the algorithm is probabilistic. But then um, um, also, well, I guess, OK, so with our approximation, that's the only probability that comes in. In reality, we would also, this, this yt would also be a random variable. Um, here it's, it's uh, fixed, uh, again, because we have this infinitely many samples. But so, so the process is essentially uh, random because of of this short noise and because of um, the choices of measurement. But we can say with, with probability 1, it will, will convert. So that's the strongest thing we can uh, say here. Um, good. Um, so how do we show this? Well, there is a nice relation that is kind of comes from this construction. Um, and, and that one is a, is a little bit beyond what we, we can prove here. But I can give you the intuition for it. And this relation says that the relative entropy distance between the true state and um, and um, um, our estimate decreases. So 
this, the distance decreasing means that this, this uh, right hand side is positive, right? That this distance is larger than this one. So I'm saying this distance decreases um, by essentially a, a factor that depends only on, on the, the learning rate. So if I increase the learning rate, it, it will decrease more. Um, and the loss function at the value of the loss function at time t. So this means if I actually observe a large loss, then I can do a better correction of my state and, and, and I will get closer to the target. If, if I observe, um, I, if I do a measurement for which m I already matched the expectation, um, then I, I learned nothing and, well, I learned that my estimate is probably good, but I cannot update. I don't know how to update. Right? The, the gradient would be zero in that case. So, but as soon as, uh, uh, as the, um, I get a loss, then I actually can do an update which will bring me closer to the, to the state. So this, this um, holds for uh, for um, an eta that's smaller than one half. So I cannot uh, arbitrarily uh, make the, the updates arbitrarily large anyway. Otherwise it would be a little bit too easy. Um, Okay, so this statement is a little bit um, tricky to prove. One needs some matrix analysis to do this. Um, we're not going to go into this, but I mean, one thing you can kind of think of is because of the, the form of the update rule, you can essentially just plug it in into the uh, definition of relative entropy, and it already simplifies quite a lot. Um, the only difficult thing to analyze is really this, this normalization constant, and that, that is a little bit annoying. Um, so if you if you're really interested, um, I can give you a, a paper reference where this is explained. Okay, but then um, once we we believe this, it it has a, a very nice property because of, of this difference here. What we can do is we just sum up all of of these loss functions, or I mean, we, we do the sum on both sides of the equation, obviously. Um, and if we do this, we see that these terms cancel each other out, right? So the only thing that's actually left in the end is the one at the beginning minus the one at, at the end. Um, and that's, that's T plus one now, capital T. Right, you, you see that they, they just cancel, all the others canceled out. And this is nice because um, this we can further bound by just the first term using positivity of the, of the relative entropy. We can just throw this away. And this is actually bounded so, so um, I don't know if you if you see this immediately, but because the state um, rho zero is a uniform state, um, we can we can bound this quantity immediately by by log of the dimension. Um, so this may be maybe it's worth um, writing it down so you can see why this is. Uh, So this would be this quantity, um, which you can write as trace uh, minus entropy of rho. And now you see, okay, um, this term is, is smaller than zero, so I can just bound it by zero. Um, and the first term, when rho zero is uh, uniform, then um, this is log identity divided by dimension, so, so it's proportional to log dimension. 
um, and trace row is one, so so this just gives you the log dimensions. Um, okay, so so this is very nice because now we can even take the sum um, if we if we want, or we can take the eta on the other side too. Um, we can take the sum from zero to infinity of this log function, and it will have to be small or equal to log d divided by the the learning rate now. Um, so this is interesting because somehow this tells us that the loss function cannot be large too many times, right? Um, this is an infinite sum. Um, so, so for this to be bounded by a constant, um, at some point the loss needs to go to zero. So that's the, the intuition we can already get um, from this, and, and we'll use that more. But we are not really interested in the end in what the loss function does. Um, we want to have a statement about the, the norm, right? So um, what we do next is we actually take the expectation. So this loss function is taken now for, for a particular sequence of, of uh, measurements and, and, uh, and, and results. Um, but we can take the expectation value of this. So what uh, happens then is that we, we, we still get this sum, but now of the expectation. And expectation is going to be over the measurement choice of the loss function So that's just the, the left-hand side. Um, and now this, we can further analyze. So this expectation of the loss function, um, what we want to do is, is first write out the loss function. And I can do that. Um, where is the loss function? It's up there. So I can actually take the sigma here out and then just write uh, rho t hat minus rho and I want to square this okay so it's a trace of, of something squared now one way of, of writing a trace of something squared um, I'm not gonna write this sum every time this expectation but one one way to write it is as a instead as a trace of the tensor product of this with itself. So the tensor product of this with itself looks something like this. Um, and I can pull out the multiplication. So what did I do here? Um, well, first of all, I can just multiply this in, right? And I get the same types of terms. But instead, instead of taking the trace squared, I'm just taking the trace of, of this tensor product, which is the, just the trace squared, if you compute it. Right, because trace A tensor B is just trace A times trans, uh, trace B. Uh, th this is trace A, to A tensor A in this case. Um, Okay, so that's one thing to do. And now I can use the linearity to, in fact, pull in this expectation. So I can write this as trace and then have the expectation here of the measurement. So this expectation is, is always over, over sigma p. Um, and then times whatever I've, I've had here. And now, so this this expectation you actually computed 
in the exercise. So that would be um, exercise um, three D, I think. Um, one can ha find a nice expression for this expectation, um, and in fact, this expression is. Um, E over d squared minus one times the so-called um, flip operator, swap operator, um, minus one over d squared minus one times identity. So this is the expectation, and then um, I still have these other terms. Now, um, and these other terms, I can, um, well, in fact, one of these terms I can discard, I can discard immediately, um, because if I have an identity here, um, then it means I just c compute the trace of, of this term here, so identity cancels out, but this is actually traceless, because it's a difference between two states, so these individual things have to trace zero. So this second term just drops out. Um, and the first term, is now this swap operator times um, this expression. And that turns out to have a nice form. And this is you compute in exercise three C. So this expression here with the swap operator is equivalent to just the square of of this expression. So the square here is inside the trace. That's important. So we went kind of from having the square outside the trace to having it inside the trace. And that is another, that is kind of a, a neat trick. So if you if you um, do the exercise, you, you, you will see why, why this happens. I'm not going to go into this. But it's a, it's a very useful trick to, to rewrite the square of, of a matrix as a tensor product in a matrix. So that's often very useful. But here we're actually using it in the other direction. And, and this is nice because this is now a norm. So this is d over d squared minus one. So that's the p norm and so that is the uh, trace. I meant to open this. I don't want to do it. I have my sum here. Yeah, I think I want to do this. That way you can avoid any mathematical problems, but since I'm expression here. So the, what happens really is that by taking the expectation for its log function, we took the expectation of a measurement product kind of evenly distributed across all spatial elements of the matrix. And so we, this means that we kind of swap all directions. And thus the loss function goes to, to zero, then also the norm goes to zero. It's just equivalent. Um, 
Okay, so then we're almost done with the proof because now what we've shown is really that um, the sum of all these um, two norms is smaller than um, a constant. That depends on the dimension. So we can kind of imagine that if the dimension is is large, um, and this problem becomes more difficult because there are more um, measurements we need to average over and so on. And uh, thus this sum can potentially get uh, larger. Um, but this infinite sum being bounded by a constant really implies that the limit of uh, this norm needs to go to zero. And in fact, then we can um, use inequalities between... Uh, Um, between the different norms to say that any norm distance here needs to go to zero. And that is what, what then gives us the, the result. Now what I, I, I kind of omitted here is um, an expectation, although the way um, we set up the protocol now, actually the only randomness comes from the choice of... Um, measurement, although, um, yeah, I should have still written here an expectation, um, because I, I still have an expectation in there about which path I'm, I'm, I'm taking. So, so to be careful, one, uh, this is all about expectations. Um, nonetheless, um, if we have such bounds in expectation, we can get, um, using Markov inequality essentially, to a statement about the convergence with, with probability one. Um, okay, but this is maybe not so important because I, I'm sure if you see a statement like this, you would already be happy uh, that the state converges. This distance is only zero if if um, rho t equals rho. So in the limit, we, we have to converge. Um, OK, good. Then let's take a five-minute break. And then um, in the next hour, I will talk about the different uh, problem, pack learning. OK, um, let's get started again. Um, so the topic of, of the rest of today, and maybe um, part of, of uh, tomorrow's lecture as well, is um, pack learning. So we're actually going to talk, because we're going to talk about quantum pack learning, but we also have to talk about classical uh, pack learning. So the first thing you need to understand is what pack means. It means probably... approximately correct. Um, it's <laughs> yes, exactly. So it's the same as the, uh, essentially the same concept that we use for, for tomography. Right? We had a confidence region, which is the approximately, and we were with high probability in that confidence region, which was the probably. So probably, we're probably approximately correct. Um, so it's another way of, of right, saying confidence region. <laughs> um, 
it's one of the, the very fundamental models in, in machine learning. So if you, if you ever take a, a course in classical machine learning or theory of machine learning, then you will, will have her, heard about um, pack learning. You might have even encountered the name if you haven't, because it's so ubiquitous. Um, OK, so, so let's define um, um, this, this model. So we, we start with a set. And it's called the instance space. Um, the ones we are going to look at, or, or it's kind of sufficient to look at, is if, if it's just a bit string. So x is just a bit string. That's a very common um, thing. Or what well, we will look at an example where it's actually an interval. Um, interval of, of numbers. OK, so, but it can be just any set, really. Um, and then a concept is a map from x to bits. Um, or alternatively, We can think of it as a subset of of x. So you can just think of uh, that's the subset of x for which which maps to one, right? Um, essentially, this a concept splits the space into two parts: the part that is mapped to zero and the part that is mapped to one. And so you can think of of it also as just a, a subset of x. And then finally, a, a concept class is a collection of concepts. Um, OK, so essentially the point uh, will be that we, we get some samples of values of x together with um, c of x. So the concept is usually called c, and this is called capital C. Um, so we get um, a collection of points and the value of c at that, that point. And uh, from, from those examples, we should learn what the function c does, right? Um, so if the function c is an arbitrary function, then that's I mean, possible to, to do. Uh, you, we need to assume that the, the, uh, the function actually has some structure. Um, so you know, the, the example uh, we often use is, is uh, if, if this is a bit string, the x is a bit string corresponding to, let's say, an image file. Um, and then um, c could be uh, a map that tells you if an image is a, um, a particular image is an image of a cat or not. And such we know that such functions they are not arbitrary. Um, such functions have some structure. They will, for example, not change when when you um, just change the value of one single bit. Right? It's still an image of a cat. So they, th these functions have structures, and that's why we can hope to learn them. If it's just an arbitrary function where when you change a bit, it's now no, no longer a cat. Uh, then there is just no hope of learning anything. You would need to look at all the different inputs and get the, the function values for them to actually learn what this mapping is. 
But if, if there is some structure, then we can hope to learn this more efficiently. I mean, that, and that's what, why, I'm, I mean, essentially this is why machine learning can even work. Right? We need to have some structure. It might be hidden from us, and a computer might be able to see it, but the structure still has to be there. And that's what this kind of concept class entails. Um, so we will we'll, we'll see a bit more about <coughs> how, um, how this concept class is, is used. But um, first, um, wh what I said is that now we can take two distinct. So this is the same for, by the way, for the, the quantum and the classical problem. So classically, what we have, uh, what the learner has, is um, uh, an oracle. that outputs pairs, um, call them x and c of x, where x follows some distribution d. Okay, so, so the, the classical learner has access to an oracle uh, every time um, they trigger the oracle, we, it will output um, a, vo a value of x and the corresponding um, a concept map or, uh, of, uh, evaluated at x. Um, and, and C here is, is like the true concept that we are trying to find. Um, and this x follows some distribution that we, we don't uh, assume anything about what this distribution is. So not all images might be equally likely, for example. Not all bit strings. Um, okay, so that's what the classical learner sees. A quantum learner instead um, has superposition access. So quantum learner gets a state psi, which is um, just a superposition. And I'm, I'm kind of assuming here that the set is finite, which uh, if it's an interval, you wouldn't have to write this as a, as a continuous state. But um, so it's just a superposition of all the x um, with the corresponding uh, concept evaluated at x. And the quantum learner gets um, this state each time. E each time they trigger the oracle, they get this, this um, state. So it seems like the quantum um, the quantum um, oracle is much stronger because it, it kind of gives the, the whole, sometimes the whole distribution, right, encoded in this state um, with all the, um, all the values here. But, um, well, it's not so clear. It, it, it's in some sense a, a fair comparison. I mean, if you are... Uh, if you are classical and you get the, the quantum oracle, the, the only thing you can kind of do is measure x. Um, and if you measure x and, and this register here, you, you just get this pair with the distribution d, right? So it's, if you measure this state, then it's like sampling from, from this other oracle. Um, it's just that as a quantum learner, you might use this state directly and do something with it apply some quantum algorithm on it, do some uh, Grover search or something with it. Um, so the question that we essentially ask is whether, whether this really helps. Um, whether, uh, uh, the question that we were going to ask in, in this section is whether we can do with less samples. So if we can 
here taking one um, sample is, uh, you count the samples, and here you count the number of states. Right? And can we do it fewer? That's, the, that's essentially the question we will have. But, um, yeah, so that's the model. Um, so what do we want to do? What does the learner want to do? The goal of the learner is to find a hypothesis H is also a function from x to 0, 1. And, and he wants to find this with probability uh, at least 1 minus delta, a hypothesis H um, such that if we take a random x according to this distribution d, um, then we want the probability that h of x is not equal to c of x. That should be small. Okay, so this is probably approximately Correct. Right, and, and, and you can convince yourself, um, same as with tomography, um, that this is really all we can hope for. Because, so this delta is, is necessary because we could have received very unfortunate um, um, samples here that didn't really tell us much about how the the function really behaves. So if we if we only get very unlikely x, for example, um, then there is no way we can show we can find the function um, on on the other x, right? We we have just have no information about how h behaves on on the more likely x, and so, and so we cannot guarantee that, that this probability is small. So there is always a probability of getting bad samples, which is why we need this delta. And then even if we have uh, good information about what the function is, we, we don't know its value at all points. So the best thing we, we can do is um, hope that given the samples we've received, we, we kind of know how it behaves on those samples, and thus um, um, we, we want to make sure that with high probability this, this function is, is correct. But again, um, yeah, you, the way you think about it is that there might be some unlikely x that we've never seen, and thus we don't know how it behaves there. So, so we, we need to allow for some error here. With, with probability epsilon, we reach some, some x that we n might not have sampled, and thus we don't know what the f how the function looks there. Okay, so, so we need this epsilon and delta, but still it's quite a strong um, statement. Um, so what it, it tells us is that we, if we get sufficiently many, and we'll see how many, um, samples of, of, uh, of pictures of cats, then we can with high probability, we will find a function that will identify cats correctly um, with probability 1 minus epsilon. That's what it, it says. Um, good. So let's start with um, an example. And that, that's a still a classical example. Um, and a very simple one. So simple that we can actually um, analytically write down what the what the learner would do. So in this sample uh, example, 
we take x to be an interval between 0 and 1, and concepts are intervals in, well, intervals in this interval. So we can graphically, uh, best to think about this purely graphically, so, so we have this interval 0 and 1, and, and C of, of x can either take the value 0 or 1, so it's, it's kind of a, a trivial function, but now these concepts would look like this, for example. Um, so it's just 1 in, in some interval. Um, or you can see it is, it's some function that... Uh, uh, starts at zero, or well, it could start at one, but um, usually starts at zero. Then at some point goes up and then down again, and that's all it does. Okay. Obviously, this is a a, um, a, a restricted class, so this defines the, the, <laughs> the this defines the concept class, right? There are these intervals in here. Um, and yeah, I mean they they might look arbitrary, but I, I'm kind of forcing them to start at at zero and then and then go down again. Uh, or in principle, could could start at one. Um, so this is a relatively easy concept class. You could also think of. Uh, functions that uh, at least change uh, or change at most k times the value, something like this. That will give you different um, um, concept classes that are, are more difficult to learn. Um, but this, this is a, a relatively simple one, and there's a, um, a notion called uh, the VC dimension that I'm just going to quickly introduce with this example. Um, that tells you how difficult the concept class is. So um, this is VC dimension. This stands for uh, Wapnik and Cervonenkis. Um, so it's two two names. Uh, it hasn't any other meaning. Um, and this is defined as follows. And the the um, um, definition is sounds very abstract, um, but you will see in the example what it what it actually means. Uh, it's not that complicated. So we uh, have a set um, a subset of of X of uh, size D. We say that this set is shattered by C if um, for every um, this is now a d-bit string there exists a concept C A in C such that C A of, of X one up to C A of X D. So this gives a bit string and this should e be equal to A. Um, and then we say the V C dimension of um, C is the, the size of the of the largest set it can shatter. Okay, very abstract definition. Uh, it took me a while to 
to actually understand it myself, what this really means. Um, and the way to understand it is, I think, with, with uh, this example. So what do we want to do? Um, we want to find some points. And in this case, actually, we can take um, two points. So let me take a point. Uh, well, let me draw a new one. A little bit bigger. Um, so let me take two points, x1 and x2. Okay, and now I need to find um, concepts so that uh, I get. Um, this vector of C evaluated at these two points gives me all possible types of bit strings. So if I choose these two points, for example, and I want to get 0, 0, I can take um, this kind of interval, for example. And this is now gives me a 0, 0, right? Because the concept of both of them is, is 0. And uh, similarly, if I want, for example, a 1, 0, I can take such an interval. Um, and maybe for this one, I can take C, 0, 1. Right, and if I want both of them to be 1, uh, I can do something like this. That would be... C11. Okay, so this set um, given by x1 and x2 is shattered by the, the concept class. I mean, this concept gives 1 and 1, and, and so on. Now, in, in this example, though, if I try to add an, a, a third point, can you see something going wrong? I can I still shatter. Three points. Uh, yeah, no, that's the problem, right? One zero one, you cannot do, um, because yeah. So if I have three points, well, let me. Uh, let me draw another one, it's easier. So if I have three points, then I have a problem because I cannot get the, the sequence uh, C101. That would require me to do, have to do something like this, that I go up, down, and then up again. But this is not in my concept class. Right, because my concept class is just one interval, and so so I'm I'm stuck here. I cannot do three. Um, so in this case, the VC dimension um, is two. And I mean, in this, if you if you do um, if you make it more complex and you you allow k changes, um, then you can see that the VC dimension will just be k. In in this in this simple example, you you can easily compute the the VC dimension. In in practice, for 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 um, uh, more realistic problems, it will, will might be very difficult to to actually compute the VC dimension. Um, but it's a very useful concept, uh, as we will see, to describe how difficult um, a concept class is to learn. Um, good. Um, when, Lydia, when do I finish again? I forgot. 20 past, okay. Good. Yeah. Sure. Oh, um, 
well, you can kind of, <coughs> that's just a number of elements in this, right? Um, but it turns out D is then the dimension, the VC dimension. Yeah, so D, D would be the, just the size of the set. Um, good. So now um, let's um, look at a classical learner for this this example. And uh, I think I don't. Um, I'll, I'll give you kind of a sketch of 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 how one analyzes this, but at least the the protocol should be uh, relatively easy. So we assume that x is actually uniform. So d is the, is the uniform distribution. And now you're tasked with learning or creating a hypothesis for, for the concept. So you get some samples. Right, so essentially, there is a true concept that may, might look something like this. Um, but what you get are just some points. So you, s you sample some points. Um, say you have a point here, here. Um, well, that's only four points. It might be difficult, but for even for s such a number of samples, you could come up with a hypothesis of what the, the function might look like. Uh, what, what would be your guess? If you just have these four points, let me make it a bit more annoying. Uh, like this. We have a few more points. What, what would be your hypothesis for the, the concept? Yes, yeah, because you, you know it's it's it has to be like this interval, you know what, what the concept class is. So you just try to, to fit um, a curve. And so, so probably you would take these two points here, uh, take the, the middle, and then say, OK, let's take this. And here you would uh, also go in the middle, go somewhere here. right? And, and your estimate would just be this interval at this point. I, I think this is the best you can do uh, with the information you, you have. Right? There is no magic. Uh, you, you just that's, that's the information you have, so, so you need to come up with a guess. Um, so this is, is probably the optimal thing, but we don't really need it to be the optimal one. Um, we want to analyze, though, whether this strategy will give us um, uh, um, um, a pack, um, or will satisfy the, the pack condition, so this epsilon delta condition. And we also want to know how many samples we need to take until it does satisfy the condition for a particular epsilon and delta. Um, so the idea here is that we can come up with a sufficient condition so so we call this this um, function is the hypothesis right this is h and this was the c the underlying one um, so a sufficient condition for h to be uh, an epsilon approximation is as follows. So I'm also, I'm going to do it graphically because I think it's, it's more 
or insightful. So we have this concept. Now, the critical areas here are around the edges, right? So we need to get samples around the edges. If we don't have samples around these edges, then, then we might be in trouble. Um, because then we, we don't really know where, where the edge is going to be. So what we can do is we can draw uh, some regions around the edges. And those are of size epsilon. So this would be epsilon. And the claim is that so the, the if we get a sample in all four boxes, so like box one, two, three, and four. Then H will uh, satisfy So that, that's that's the claim. Now we need to convince ourselves that this this claim is true. So if we get uh, points in these boxes, let's say, well, this is not a color. So example for for the the, the right edge, we get a point here and we get a point here. Okay. So then our hypothesis would put the edge in the middle. Um, but in, in particular, for any two points in these boxes, uh, the distance between the edge of, uh, of C and the edge of H is at most epsilon over 2. Okay, but these, these regions have, have a size epsilon. So if I, um, the worst case is kind of when, when I have one at the, uh, at the corner here and the other at the corner here, in which case I would put the edge in, in the middle of this uh, box. And so I'm by epsilon over 2 off. Right, can, you, can you see that? Um, so the worst case, uh, let me draw here the worst case. So if, if I take at this point and this point, um, then the, the edge would be would be put in the exactly in the in the middle of this uh, leftmost box, and so I'm off by epsilon over two from the actual edge. And this means that. With probability epsilon over two, I'm actually going to hit the point where where the two differ. Right? If I draw x randomly. And same here. So, but the point is, if I am in these boxes, then at most, uh, with probability epsilon, I will hit the point that uh, where the functions differ. Okay, so now we can ask um, if, if we, we are convinced ourselves of this claim, then we can ask what is actually the probability of, of hitting um, these boxes or not hitting them? So the first is the probability... of not hitting a box one 
um, uh, after n samples. W what is that probability? Does somebody can tell me? The, the box has size epsilon, right? So we probability epsilon, I will hit it when I pick a random x. Um, so the probability of not hitting it after n samples is just uh, 1 minus epsilon to the n. At every single time, I need to be outside. And those are independent events. Uh, it, the samples are independent. So I get 1 minus epsilon to the n. Um, and then the probability... of not hitting either uh, of the four boxes of their n samples. That is just four times this by the union bound. Uh, and probability of this happening for box 1 or this happening for box 2 or uh, 3 or 4, the union bound is just 4 times the probability of each single one happening. Um, okay, and so that's our failure probability, right? Because if, if we hit them, um, then, then we know by our claim that our hypo hypothesis will be good. So this is really delta. Okay, and so what we can do is we can solve this for n. Um, will look something like this. And um, then we realize that if epsilon is small, um, this log 1 minus epsilon is proportional to well, it's essentially minus epsilon. Um, so this whole thing you can write as log or divided by delta or epsilon. Um, so that's actually very similar to the sample complexities we had for tomography, if you if you remember, except we had an epsilon squared there. Um, But yeah, if you want to, to have the, the shorthand notation, looks like this. Uh, this is not a D, it's a delta, sorry. Okay, so, so that gives us, um, with this sim very simple um, learning strategy, um, we we can get a bound on on the number of samples that we need. Um, now you can imagine that in in practice, if you do machine learning, you I mean you could never write down um, and um, analyze what what uh, how to generate this hypothesis. I mean that's the kind of the difficulty, right? We took such an, uh, a simple example where we can easily find the, the strategy and, and analyze how many samples it needs. But this is obviously, it uh, gives us an intuition of, of how this behaves, but doesn't really tell us too much about uh, machine learning in practice. But still, it's interesting because we want to compare, um, in the end, we want to compare to the quantum um, 
version where you have access to this oracle. This was all a, a completely classical strategy. So this we will do next time uh, or tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, no, I think it's, so then um, we'll do the, it's better to take the, the break now and uh, continue on Thursday. Thank you.